Welcome to Firecat First Friday, November of 2021. Uh, it's hard to believe we're almost all the way through 2021. Time is an elastic concept for me always, but especially this year. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Firecat First Friday is a user experience discussion that we host once a month, and we bring in some of our smart friends. <laughs> to uh, share wisdom and help all of us understand design thinking, product design, user research and usability, uh, digital design, innovation, all that type of stuff. My name is Susan Price and I'm the CEO of Firecat Studio and we do uh, projects and consulting in all of those areas with a focus on user experience design. So if you have ideas of future topics or you yourself uh, would like to be considered for presenting a topic, they're easy. <laughs> um, one hour, we're going to run this right on time. So um, without further ado, I will introduce my smart friend, Laura Faulkner. She is a PhD user research type of person, uh, currently doing user research program at Rackspace, but she's been at this a long time and she has evolved an innovative research framework. Uh, so, Laura, why don't you go ahead? Hi, thanks. I'm so excited to be here and uh, be here with some of my other smart friend. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Susan and I actually met at an event where we were both being smart people. So, <laughs> so we, and we've been friends ever since. So uh, it's great to be here with you today. It's, it's a real honor and pleasure to get to share things with, with my field. Somebody asked me, it's like, what is your goal for doing this sort of thing? Why, why do you do this? It's, it's, it's to develop all of us and to, to develop the next generation. I'm really a lot about the legacy of our field and, and my career and, uh, and, and what I've learned and helping to codify that and getting that down to simple. So, so what you're going to hear today is uh, some of it hopefully will look like common sense because great UX anything always just looks like common sense. Well, I could have thought of that. Well, that's just like this. Well, that's just like that. But I hope to take you down into some more in-depth ways in which I've codified a couple of things uh, that, that help us uh, stay focused on goal-driven research. And so uh, I, uh, here we go, and I'll introduce myself a little more. Let's see, there we go. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, who is this doctor person? Uh, that, that would be me. I have a uh, doctorate in research psychology. I actually got that directly toward user experience. I was excited to, uh, as the field was developing, uh, to, to really bring everything I could to the table. And so I pursued, I have degrees in anthropology, psychology, and sociology. And my uh, master's and doctorate are in experimental psychology. That was a quantitative degree. And uh, however, I, I had the great privilege of doing it all on user experience and user experience method uh, evaluation and research methodologies. I have been also a, a director of design. So I was in the in, back in the day before we started specializing, uh, we, we did it all. We did the design, we did the research, we did everything. Uh, research is like my specialty and my major. And so uh, while I will still do some interaction design at the high level, I really prefer to leave that to the experts these days. And I head up a research team at Rackspace Technology. We just call ourselves research because we don't limit our methods. So if there's a question, we're going to apply the best method to it. So that is where we are with all of that. And I have, have had the great privilege of just celebrating my 25th anniversary in user experience. So back before it was a job, <laughs> when it was something that we called usability that we just practiced and we were trying to introduce that nobody had heard of yet and to watch it develop and to, to get to be part of it developing into a paid profession. And now to break off into what each of us major in is really awesome. So, uh, so uh, here we go. So the, one of my favorite people in the world that, that really has, has made a difference in how I think about user experience research. So I'm gonna, we're gonna major on research today. 
And this is useful both for researchers, designers, any, anybody. So if you're a DIY researcher or if you want to help your researchers move ahead a little better uh, uh, or you're you know, a designer who likes to do their own, um, I'm hoping that some of this will, will help provide you some guidance in all of that. So this one person that I'm just really a great fan of, she, she just has a brilliant way of distilling things down into, into their essence. And really this, this one piece of wisdom that she shares uh, tells the whole story of where I think the, the core focus of all UX research should be, and that is on the front end. So if we have analysis, you know, we, have, we have user research sessions, we have analysis, we have reporting, we have archiving our reports and all of that. I think if all of that is this big, I propose that the planning and the intake part should be this big. <laughs> so to keep it to because of what this wonderful person once said. Mary Poppins. <laughs> I love Mary Poppins. She's very practical. She's a little hard. But this is the single most important thing that, uh, that I think contributes to our field. It's easy to remember. Everybody can memorize it. You can memorize it immediately. Well begun is half done. And so that's why I make that of all of the things that we do, if we can do the early part of discovering with our stakeholders before we even begin to discover on behalf of and for our stakeholders, then we have a, a better chance of actually getting what they want, what they need, and having research, having research that has impact both for the short term and for the long term. Well begun is half done. If you remember nothing else from this, remember that and get it into your soul, into your spirit, into your cells. And go ahead and take the discipline because our profession moves fast. We don't always have time to like write discipline to discipline plans and do all of this and do all the details right beforehand because somebody wants you to test something today and you've still got to recruit and you've still got to do all of this. I'm here to tell you that well begun is half done. Okay, so I'm gonna give you all the goods right up front. This, these are exactly the two pieces that I'm, gonna, that, that I'm gonna share with you today. And this is about specifically about the two methods that, uh, not that I've necessarily developed, all of us do these sorts of things. So where you hear things, you say, well, I already knew about that. But, uh, but I've taken it into some deeper directions uh, that, that, uh, that I'm really proud of having, having codified and set out on paper in a way that I can also teach them to other people. Other people can adopt them and adapt them. So if you can adopt and adapt, I will have, have, have had a, a great success and contributed even more than my daily UX work. So I love to contribute more than anything to yours. So these are the two pieces and these is, this is everything you need to know about these two pieces is first, um, I do a disciplined research intake process and a few of the things I'm going to be repetitive about so you can remember. So that UX research intake, that is a formal, formal, it's seemingly informal conversation to the stakeholder, it's going to seem informal. To me, I have a disciplined process behind it. And that is a 20 minute that's it, 20 minute conversation, live conversation. No, it is not a form that anybody has to fill out and I will explain why. It is a 20 minute conversation that you have with your stakeholders from the moment somebody first says, I need, I need some research or, okay, we can all do our collective eye roll, are you ready? We need a survey. Right. <laughs> I bet you've heard that one before. It's like most of the time inside I'm saying, no, dear, you, you really don't need a survey. I 99% I, of the time you're not going to need a survey. That's as we all know, that's not usually our best go to method. Um, uh, and when it is the right method, it's totally the right method. Uh, but when, when somebody comes to you said either I need research or I have a question or I want to study this or I need a survey. Uh, I said, let me, let's have this 20 minute conversation first. If I've had that 20 minute conversation before over and over with a stakeholder, I will, uh, I will say, let's have our intake conversation. They'll get that by the time they've worked with me two or three times, they know this or worked with my team. So my team is also very adept at this. Um, they have really adapted it and they take it in their own directions as their own added sections to it and that sort of thing. 
So, uh, so in this, yes, 20 minute conversation each time. My favorite thing about that process is that, uh, uh, well, actually I'll share that one in a minute. Okay, so then the other part is the UX research plan. This will look familiar to you. A lot of this is not gonna be rocket science, but I'm gonna, I may uh, help you uh, create it in a slightly different order than you may think of. Uh, because there's certain places that as you guys, as, as researchers, we're always uh, wanting to skip or that our stakeholders especially are wanting to skip to, uh, but there's an order of operations. And so what we're going to do is learn about what, how do we talk about the goals for the business, the goals for the research, these objectives, and then the methods. And so there's certain order in which we, we do these. Uh, the hint and, and up front, the, the preview is objectives and questions is where you start and you go no further until you identify the goals. This is what the, this presentation is about, is getting us to goal-driven research. You'll see goals here, goals for the research, goals for the business. And now I'm going to show you how these two things interlock and, uh, and, and, and then what are some of the details for how to get them done. Okay, so we love the word why. Yes, yes, that's our favorite word. I mean, that's what we live for, especially as, as UX researchers, uh, but and as as designers as well. It's like you you want to know the why. What are you? What are our stakeholders trying to solve? What are our users trying to solve? And what? Why are our users having trouble? So why? It's it's like it's the most. It's the most beautiful word in user experience is getting to the why. So let's get to that. And designers, I know that you get you need to get to this before you go do a design. Somebody says, I need to add a button. What's the first question you're gonna ask them? Why, what is that gonna do for you? What is the user, what problem are you trying to solve? What, what does the user need? Why do they need that? And then also in terms of UX research, it's like, it's not just about, what do you need to know? But why do you need to know this? Who's asking? What is what is this about? And it's really all about the goals. Uh, so we know that about the goals. My favorite uh, example uh, that that I learned a, a long time ago was uh, about UX goals. Is uh, why does someone go to a microwave? So this is why I do when I'm teaching stakeholders uh, goal driven work and, and goal driven user experience. Uh, this is the, the, the example I often use. Okay, somebody's coming up to a microwave, right? They have frozen food in their hand. That's not, they're coming up to a microwave. What is the user goal? The first answer back, I can almost hear all of you saying that that, that we'll hear from, from, from most stakeholders is, uh, well, I want to use the microwave. No, that is not your goal. Do you do, you, when you walk up to a microwave, you don't really care about using the microwave. And so then, then take them through a series of things. Well, well, I want to heat up the food. Okay, well, yeah, you do want to heat up the food. And to do that, you need to use the microwave. We're getting closer, we're getting closer. Okay, so, so really, what are we really trying to do? We wanna eat hot food, that's our goal, right? And so how might the design be different? How might the research study be different? How might anything be different if we know what is the real goal behind it? I wanna sit down and eat hot food. That's what it's really about. And that's why we're here. That's why we make things simple. Okay, so why are they here? All right, so this is, I, I, I want to, to, to put a little context around how these next two processes came about. One is just they kept they came about over time and practice, but why did I end up writing them down and and why did I I ultimately do it this way, and there was uh, so our, our own research team, we actually had a very serious break with a stake, stakeholder, it was it was a dreadfully painful situation, and uh, we're the stakeholder had come and they they said we need this research and we said great let's do that for you and 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 uh and so we did exactly what the stakeholder wanted we went out and did that study and we came back and the stakeholder was just downright pissed and honestly he didn't want to speak to us not for and and he stopped asking us to help and do things he started working around us i mean y'all this was a serious breach 
And, you know, from a position of, of research leadership, it, it, this just killed my soul because this is not what we're about. It, it doesn't allow us to live our purpose, to make our contribution and to have things be better for our users. And so, um, so how, how do we recapture that? And so, uh, so what, what I actually did was that we all, we were all in pain, like the whole team was in pain. We, we didn't really understand what happened. And so I invited everybody. We, we happened to all live in the same, in the same city at that time. And it was, it was, it was a, a couple of years before COVID or maybe three years before COVID. And uh, so I brought them all around my kitchen table and I made some soup and some bread. <laughs> and we sat down for a day. And in that day, we did a number of, we, we investigated, we did actually a root cause analysis, which is uh, another, another process that I teach uh, that I've developed a simple way to do it for UX people. And we did, we, we took it down to, to its essentials. And we really got down to that the ultimate root cause analysis was that we had missed something on the front end. And so this is where well begun is half done comes in. And we came down, so we came up with all sorts of different ways to help us reestablish relationship with stakeholders, but really to help us begin with stakeholders in the first place. And so the first thing we did, just so you know, how did we correct that with that stakeholder and how did we get back in with them is that we went in and we applied a two word formula. And that was to be curious, to be curious about what was really going on in that stakeholder's world, to understand why did they come to us with the question in the first place? So we started asking a whole nother level of why well before we ever talked to users. So in that, what we got to is a series of processes that let us make a bigger difference that actually let us shift attitude and action. And so we do that by first listening in a whole new way and in a structured way. So uh, part of my contribution to the, to, to, and what I want to be my contribution to the field, to the world, to our, to our careers, is, and, and my dissertation research as well, is taking things that are simple and that, uh, and that get done in a whole lot of different ways and then creating a simple structured framework for how to do that. And so that is what Susan, when she came to me, she said, your framework, talk about your framework. So I'm gonna uh, now dive into those two parts of this framework so that we can, and this is, y'all, this is why these two steps in this level of depth are worth it. So that we can make a difference in attitude and action. That, that has a lot to do with how we report on the back end but it has even more to do with how we begin on the front end. All right, so now I'm gonna dive right in. And, uh, and we're just gonna stay on this slide for a while because this is, this is really, I decided to condense it all in this one space so you can see it and we can talk about it and, uh, and, and go through these different details. So here is this first 20 minute conversation. So, so I may get somebody who comes in, you know, I need a usability study, I need a survey, I needed this, I needed that. So great. Uh, let me get on your calendar for 20 minutes. Uh, by the way, there's a psychological advantage to saying 20 minutes because it's less than a half an hour. And it, so it doesn't sound like a meeting. It sounds like a quick connect. Um, I do want to give you one little hint. When you begin later, uh, when you first begin this process, and, and if you decide to apply something like this, go ahead and schedule for your very first one. Try to do it with a, a friendly stakeholder who's willing to spend 50 minutes with you. So just under an hour, right? Uh, so they have time to have their break and everything. Be kind, be, be user friendly. Uh, and, and then as you get good at it, by, and then by the second one, you can do it in about 30 minutes. And then after that, you'll get really good at it and you can do this conversation in 20 minutes. Um, these, each of these pieces comes from detailed business processes made simple. So these are this comes from all sorts of practices from uh, from business, from, uh, from software development management, old school software quality engineering, new user experience practices. So each of these boxes has a whole lot of depth between it, but I'll uh, talk about making it simple today. But ultimately what you're gonna do is you're gonna just get on the calendar of a 20 minute live conversation. Uh, okay, so in this live conversation, 
it begins with the single most important question that you're going to ask for any research, uh, any research study. And it's this yellow one right here. You're, you're going to notice that this, uh, these boxes are not in the necessarily in the order that I'm doing them. I have these two reversed. This is actually our, whoops, that's actually our first box. I got excited and pushed a button. <laughs> so problem statements actually our first box. I'll explain why these are in a different order in just a minute. That has to do with the product more than the process. But this one's turned yellow, problem statement, because that is the very first thing we do. The very first question in a research intake is, what problem are you trying to solve? Uh, designers, I'd also like to you to be listening to this process. Is the, it, Are some of these steps gonna be useful and usable for you to have a design opening conversation with stakeholders. I'd be interested to hear how you do your own intakes in that, in that area now that I'm a specialty research person. So when we ask what, what problem we're trying to solve, that is trying to get down to, uh, yeah, why are they here? Uh, and and then, then, then I start to drill down on that. If I spend the whole session just on that one problem statement, then it is a win, then it's an absolute win. And the next is, Who's, who, are you, who are you doing this for? So you have a product manager come to you and they'll tell you, well, you know, well, that, that's for me. It's, yeah, yeah, it's for me or, or the developers or somebody. Another key question that you're going to be asking is, who, uh, who's your boss? Who do you report to? What does success look like for you? Because the big thing, and here's the big attitude that I come in with between the problem statement and the stakeholder is that I want to know I'm coming in being for that moment more for the stakeholder who's asking for the research than anybody else, even for my user for just a few minutes, for just a few minutes. We'll get back to the user because that's what we do. We are the user advocate, right? But in that, in this 20 minute intake conversation, I am wholly for the stakeholder who is asking, and I want that person to be successful. So what can I do in this 20 minutes? What can I discover that's going to help them be successful? So I'll ask who their boss is, and I'll ask who they're reporting to, and what they're expected to deliver, and what does success look like for them? Y'all, these two questions change the whole conversation, because they'll come in asking, well, I need a usability study on this thing, and they want you to you know, study on whether we need this button or not. But in asking what problem are you trying to solve and taking it up to that higher level, what's the business problem you're trying to solve? What do you have to achieve, say, as a product manager? So I'm going to use product manager as an example throughout here. And then, okay, what is, what is that, you know, what are you accountable for by the end of the year for your goals or on this project? What do you have to deliver and to who? Who do you need to make happy? Because this is often where research project, user experience research projects, user experience design projects fail is right here at the beginning because we fail to ask who is pressuring you to deliver this thing that you're asking us to help you with. So this is where we, we can totally get off base. And so we can get on base before we even start. Yeah, uh, it's awesome. Okay, so then we ask who the stakeholders are. We include ourselves, we include the designers, we include anybody else. And then we have, so, and here's why this is in order, is because we have our instant uh, copy two right here in this box when we're done. So this is both a product and a process, both of these things, the intake and the research plan, both products and processes. And uh, so we begin with our problem statement, we get our stakeholders, but then we have this instant at a glance sheet. And I'm going to show you the at a glance sheet in just a moment. Once we get down to those, then we get to the optional things. If we've only covered these two things in 20 minutes, fantastic. We're still doing great. But if we can get these other things, and when you become skilled, you can, is that we begin, then I ask the constraints. I say, okay, what's, what's getting in the way? What could, what could hold us back? What are the obstacles? What do you need to overcome? This is almost more of a design question because a lot of times this will have to do, this is where you get, it's better to get that surprise about, well, we have to do it in this legacy system, right? It's like they'll come to you with this design problem and they want you to design, you know, show us the blue sky design. And then you get there and you start finding out from engineers that you can't do it because no, it has to be in this thing and this language and all of that sort of thing, right? <laughs> We've all been in that pain in that pain point before. Go ahead and discover discover the constraints up front. It's like, what is it that we're not allowed to do? What what kind of 
if you're already envisioning some solutions to the problems, what kind of solutions are we not allowed to do? It doesn't mean you don't design beyond them. It doesn't mean you don't ask the questions beyond them. But let's find out what might get in our way ahead of, of it actually blindsiding us, which is part of what happened with our stakeholder over there. One, that we didn't get to the real problem statement of what he was trying to solve for his boss. And then second is that we missed that there were some constraints and we, we got blindsided by those later. And so no wonder the stakeholder got reactive about our results. Our results were going in a totally different direction than were useful to him. So, uh, so this is uh, this is where where we do. And by the way, just so y'all know, I have an imaginary stakeholder in my head. So the 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 gender may or may not be the same, and the uh, the 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 title is not the same, or 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 anything. So just so you know that this is my imaginary uh, persona that I'm talking about, um, a product manager who goes by he. Okay. So oh, by the way, my pronouns are she and they. Uh, just saying. <laughs> okay, so then next we want to know what can go wrong. Again, right alongside constraints, I use a classical risk analysis, uh, very boiled down classical risk analysis uh, method that I'm going to show you in just a minute in the details. And then how can we mitigate those? How can we make sure that the bad things don't happen? And then we ask the question, well, what do we already know? how many times have we been asked to do a study or a design or something and wait a minute we've actually we got we already have data about that we did this other study because often uh product managers or owners or uh, developers or anybody or any other designers other researchers they're asking for something that uh, that somebody else has already done something for so we try to stay aware of that and, uh, and then we look for our existing assets. This is like one of our biggest wins is that when we're able to identify an existing asset, we could say, oh, guess what? We already have answers to your question here. Let me show you. And then you wanna talk about Mary Poppins magic. <laughs> That's the awesome one. We're like, here, let me give you this report and then they can run with it and off they go. Or here, let me repackage these results for you. Or we already have a design that solves that. It's just that nobody adopted the design yet. Let's go get that for you. And then, you know, then we'll refine it for your new problem. So, uh, so document existing assets because I can guarantee you folks, nobody else is writing this down. Nobody is asking this. Nobody else is writing us down. We have a chance to be everybody's hero. By the way, I do love being a hero. I, I, I have my invisible cape. Uh, I think it's a bright blue cape. Uh, <laughs> So I love being the hero and bringing in existing assets. And then we ask them, by when do you need this? Because of course they always want it immediately. And the truth is most of the time they don't need it immediately. Or if they do, then we can do scope down versions of that. So we ask them both a short and a long timeline. All right, so that's our overview. Here's what it really looks like. And this is this is my own, our own personal, my own personal form that I use in the background. My team uses this or their own adapted versions of this. Um, uh, I have copyrighted this particular version, and so I just ask that you cite me if if you use it. But please use it; it's you know it's free for use. Uh, yeah, just yeah, be be fair and and, and share. Uh, so uh, and this is what I do. You can see I've even written notes for myself, and this is the the really the key thing. That intake is a conversation. This document does not get shared up front with the stakeholder who's coming in that you're going to have this conversation with. This is our guide and we hold it loosely. Most single, most important thing. So all my processes are going to look very disciplined and it looks like you have to do step by step. They look, they can sometimes look really intense and painful like, well, I have to do everything on it. No, you don't. These are all guidelines. These are all things that, are, that it's to be used to help you along and to help frame and give some discipline and some repeatability to your thinking and to your practice and, and to, to give you that kind of, but it's a framework. It's not a how-to and a detail and you have to fill in all the details and do it right. It's a framework and a guide to help us along. And, uh, but the beautiful thing is, is that when I, when I hold myself to the discipline of asking these questions and, and filling it out and actually not just filling it out, but making it fit into this form. Uh, so I do this on a, a PowerPoint slide and to, to, to reduce my wording, to get it down to this so that I have this at a glance thing that once it's filled out, I can share it with stakeholders, but I don't ever share the questions because it's not about them asking the questions. 
It's about us using these to ask the right questions of them and to discover. And so I begin here, well, so what problem are we trying to solve? And they'll say, well, I need a usability study. Okay, so why do you need that? And what is that gonna do for you? What is that gonna do for the business? How is that going to solve anything, you know, for like for us, for Rackspace? How, what is that, what's that gonna solve for our users? And, or what's going wrong that, that we need to do? And so if you, again, if we do nothing else, I answer this question. And so I take them up to that higher level. This is this is a little piece I was sharing earlier about what one of my uh, former product managers who that I used to partner with a lot, who just loved us, loved partnering with our team. He would call me and he would say, or, or, or message me and he would say, Laura, can we have that? Uh, he didn't, he never remembered it was calling intake. He said, can we uh, have that conversation that make pro makes product managers cry? <laughs> Because he knew I was going to hold his feet to the fire about uh, what was that problem we're trying to solve and that I was going to make him think at a higher level. And he said that the, one of the reasons he would come to me sometimes just for the intake conversation is it helped him even craft his own messaging for the whys of what he was doing. Y'all even had this happen is that when we begin to ask that question, we find out that the solution that they were getting ready to build, like add a button, it's like, oh my gosh, if I'm trying to solve this other thing, add a button is not going to solve it. Sometimes this is as far as you get. <laughs> so you have just done UX really big time if you've just shifted a direct direction by asking the right question. And then we go back and, and, and begin to add, you know, and then we get to desired outcomes, begin to ask what what is the stakeholder, you know, who are the stakeholders, who's wanting us to deliver something that can often change the conversation too. It's like, who, who do we have to be happy in here beyond the users? Because remember, our user today in the intake is that stakeholder who came to us to ask. Then we ask the technical and business constraints, you know, are there particular legacy systems? Are there things, are there things that we're not going to be able to, like, if we recommend a solution, we can't even, it, we don't even have the technology to do it. Um, are there uh, constraints about what we can, what we're allowed to ask them, maybe for legal reasons or whatever? And so we document those, and then we ask the question: How, how negotiable were those? This already sets us up for being able to come up with design solutions, for example, out of research uh, that are going to be able to be implementable and make a difference. Again, we don't limit our designs and our solutions to that and our recommendations to that. But isn't it good to be armed with information? Like, like we like to know what we're going to have to work around. And then I use a classical, like I was mentioning, a classical risk analysis uh, a question framework is I ask what are the potential risks or what bad things might go wrong. And that's going to be either in the study or the solution design or whatever. We'll go ahead and leave this wide open. But this is a great time to discover what those bad things are before they hit you um, in the process. And then, uh, and then you ask, so there's again, classical risk analysis is, which I hope I've made really simple here. What is the likelihood that's gonna happen? It's like, if this really, really bad thing, what could happen? Maybe it's that if we don't fix this, um, all of, you know, our users are gonna fail this task. Well, is it a big task? Is it a little task? Is it, is it something where they can lose their data? Is it something we're gonna lose them as customers? So, uh, so we ask, what is that possible impact? And how likely is that to happen? Is there a, 90% chance, a 5% chance. This begins to let you know what the priority of all of this is and, um, uh, uh, and helps, helps you uh, analyze timeline in the future. But then also being prepared for the bad thing up front. Remember, well begun is half done. And so we can already be prepared for, okay, if this bad thing were to happen, how do we mitigate that? Like maybe, maybe the bad, one of the bad things we come up with is we'll recruit the wrong users. Uh, because maybe we had that happen before. Uh, and then, so how can we mitigate that? Uh, let's, have, let's have some stronger criteria or take a little more time uh, or uh, recruit in a different way or however that is. It's, uh, so there, the, this is like one of my favorite parts. It's a little bit of the harder part to have, but it's, it has some wonderful results. 
And then what do we already have? I, I like to call this the, what do we have on the spaceship that's good? Line from uh, the movie Apollo 13, one of my favorites where they solved a disaster and came out, came out with something great. Uh, is, so we ask, what do we have on the spaceship that's good? So, so are there previous designs or capabilities that we've already used to solve this problem? Are there previous studies? Uh, can we just draw from best practices where we really don't have to ask, should you, should you have this kind of button or that kind of button there? Uh, maybe, you know, in basic heuristics or in, in basic good design practices, you already have an answer. So let's not waste our time doing a study and a whole new design. Uh, or, you know, or maybe we have design patterns we can use or reuse. And then do we have these existing findings or knowledge and like, oh, well, here's your ready-made answer to your question. I love that part. And then we ask the hard time one question. So is this, you know, is this a short-term thing? Is this a long-term thing? Uh, what bad things will happen if we don't get you these answers immediately or get you this design immediately? And then are there any dependencies? It's like, if we don't get these research results to you, if we don't get this design to you, um, what, what's gonna fail? Who's gonna fail? You know, what kind of things will go wrong? So this is one of my favorite things that I developed. I will tell you this, I, I budget about an hour and a half to fill this out and make it succinct after I have that 20 minute conversation. So what I've done is I've shifted the bulk of the work from the stakeholder to me so that I take as much burden off them as possible. And I go ahead and invest this because investing on the front makes such a difference. And when I'm done, I have this one sheet that, that summarizes everything. Let me tell you, stakeholders love this one because I can pass this back to them all filled out, only filled out. Like I said, I don't ever share the back end questions because then they're tempted to just email them to me. And then I don't get to do what we do, which is ask the drill downs and find the real answers to these questions. Also, it would be onerous for them to fill this out as a questionnaire. But once I fill out the, the actual pieces and replace this gray text with the answers, uh, it becomes a reference throughout the entire program. All right. Now we move on to the research plan. So you notice I spent most of my presentation time just now focusing on the intake. It's the, it seems like the smallest thing. It's the smallest asset we make for the whole, a whole research project, but it is the most important and it is the one that deserves the most attention. Now I'm gonna tell you one cool thing about a research plan is that a research plan is a process less than it is a product. So it does not matter if you never look at a research plan again, or if you just have an idea of how you're going to do it, fill it out completely. As researchers, we do this completely. We don't even worry about it having to be in, in a final format or anything, because most stakeholders are not interested in looking at it again after, you know, once we walk through it with them. Uh, and, and, they're, and they're not going to refer back to it. You might need it for reference later either to reuse because it was a great plan and you have some great stuff in it, or, and you're gonna wanna reflect back to it when you're writing your reports and analyzing your results. Uh, but, uh, but, but do a written plan, even for the simplest thing, even if you do just a short one pager, and these are the pieces that you're going to have in it. A disciplined research plan is mostly about the goals, just like good discipline UX. So I, it's like, I like to say that I like to use UX to do UX, right? So, so this is about getting to, getting to the goals. And, uh, and again, these, this is the order in which the research plan comes out. It's not necessarily the order in which you're going to do it. You're actually most of the time gonna, whoops, gonna begin right here with objectives and questions. So this, and, and here we are, disciplined research plan, UX researchers, most powerful tool. Just do it, just do it, okay? And, and even, again, even if it's for yourself, you can, you will get to where you will be able to write this out of your head and skip around in your sections and, and fill out this section, skip up to the other one in this one. Okay, so, so we're gonna begin, and, and I do have another reference slide that, that walks you through this a little better, or reference that walks you through this a little better. It is in the paper that is associated, there's a paper on Medium, that, or an article on Medium that is associated with this presentation and all of this content, and it will show you in a little more detail uh, the order of operations when you get in and do it. Most of the time after you've done the, the intake, you're, you're gonna have some of the business goals already because that's gonna come out of that problem statement. So you can jot those down, but you might have some other goals that you wanna put in there. Uh, 
And so sometimes it's easier just to start grabbing their the questions because they're going to have research questions all the time. Now, as we know, like our very secret formula, yes, our secret formula is that the questions that they want answered are not the questions that we ask of the users. You know this is as basic, but I'm telling you so that you can get it in your soul and you have somebody like me telling you, yes, your instincts are right on this. The questions that our stakeholders want answered are not the questions that we ask the user. The questions that we ask, so the, the questions that the stakeholders ask, the questions that we ourselves want answered, those are those are our research questions, which means that's the th those are the things, the framework that we want to discover. And then the questions that we ask of users, that's a measurement instrument. That's a thing, that's, that's its own thing. Those, those aren't the research questions. Those are your measurement instrument questions. So a lot of times it's easy to just ju jump in here and just start throwing things into the objectives and questions section. This is where stakeholders can, say, can ask everything they want. We can write down everything they want. There's absolutely no discipline to this section. This is part of why I like to do it first easy too, because it's easy. I just go in and I just start writing down, what is it? What kind of questions? And, and it's okay if you say for that moment, what kind of questions do you want the users to answer for you? And they'll start asking, you know, saying all these questions. We want them to tell us this, and tell us this, and, and we want to know this, and we want to know this. This is where you capture all that. And the reason you do that is that you are going to refer back to this later when you write your plan. But most importantly, you're going to review these objectives against what your final re results were so that you can reflect back. Did I answer all of that, that kitchen sink full of questions that, uh, that my stakeholders had? So write those first and then pull from the intake what the goals are and put those in as the business goals. Like if this whole project succeeds, what are you gonna get? So maybe that's it, 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 like for a profit company, it would be things like we wanna increase revenue by doing this thing, or we want to do this thing so that we can increase revenue. And, or that, you know, we, uh, that, uh, so, you know, we wanna make this thing easier for users so that more of them will come to us uh, or, or so that uh, we can save money on the back end or whatever it is. It's like, these are the, the business goals and, and then we can also include the user goals in that. And then we add another little layer, which are the research goals. It's like, what is it we wanna learn from this study? So this goals section is golden because that becomes your North Star. And I can guarantee you that if you do this goals section, all of these other things are going to be different. They're all going to be better. Uh, um, here, a and, and little, little hint, this, this part down here, the script, that's the last thing that you write. <laughs> if you have a stakeholder do it, and, and a lot of times if, if, uh, if somebody's doing DIY research, you know, say an engineer or product manager, or even some designers who are, um, who, uh, who are not, uh, Re disciplined research is not their primary job. So they're just trying to get some answers real quick. Uh, they'll go to writing script first. The first question, the first questions they have in their heads are not the script, they go in here. So we have our goals. I put this background section in as optional. You don't have to put that, but sometimes you wanna put like what happened in the past or why you're doing this program or something like that uh, because stakeholders are talking a lot about it or there might be a it's like, it's not clear what things are. So just, yeah, you can put things down in writing. So we get our goals and our objectives and questions. Once we have that, then we decide, only then do we decide what is our, who, what, what method are we going to use? Is that going to be a usability test, a contextual analysis, a task analysis, a survey? It might even be a survey. Ooh. <laughs> uh, and, and then who our participants are. You can only know this when you have goals and objectives. Then you can, can come up with the method and the participants that answer those goals and objectives. Then after that, I do a little thing called a session map. And again, in the paper, you'll see in more detail how to, how to do a session map. But a short version is it's just a little table that says, okay, first, it's kind of like your agenda. And the agenda, these, this map and tasks, are going to also refer back to the objectives and questions. So the session map and tasks are going to let you make sure that what you do during the research session are actually going to get you the maximum value from this. 
Uh, and then you can also like get some extra value because a good UX researcher is always going to get more value out of a session than just doing that one little thing. You can answer your big questions. You can answer some other stakeholders' questions. You get to build in all sorts of things. So, uh, so writing, just doing this quick table without yet writing the script is a really great reference and an interim step. And it, it's, it's just an easy guide. So it would say like, you know, my intro and warm up. you know, we want to get them online and get things working and then everything okay. And then we have task one and task one is about, uh, you know, asking them general questions. So that's the method we're going to use in task one is ask them some general questions about their history or a, a time when this thing went wrong. You know, it's one of the great ways to open a, a research study and, uh, and then begin to get that, that kind of thing. It's like, okay, now we're going to go do this usability task and we want them to do that thing. And so, uh, and then all the way down to our wrap up, this makes it a lot easier to write the script. And then this becomes the outline for your script. I do recommend writing a full on formal verbatim script, not that you will use it, but it helps frame your thinking. So even as a long time, very experienced disciplined thinker, I will most often write this script and I will have my question like, well, what did you think about that? And how was that for you? And then my favorite follow-up question, why is that? Why is that? Tell me more about that. Why is that? Tell me more about that. So, uh, and, and I do that as a reminder and, and to kind of, I glance at it to help me uh, uh, keep track during the session. And then we also put that as a column in our shared notes document. We take notes together in a, um, in a spreadsheet. Uh, like everybody all at once, we usually have three to four note takers if we can. We prefer live notes to reviewing recordings. Uh, that may seem like, uh, like a lot of trouble, but actually it's a lot faster and everybody has in their heads, they've, they've gotten to physically see this session. So there's a lot of benefits to doing that. Uh, so anyway, this is, this is the research plan and those are the two things to write down. And, um, and, and, and then we, we work on to action-centric reports. So that, that's, the, that's the next step uh, is, is that we take that will begun and we create it into things that are actions. If we have done this and we have actually done that intake, this intake that tells us what, you know, what is the problem we're trying to solve to get down to what are the real goals. If we have documented then what are the business goals, then our the, our actual findings are going to track back to the business goals. So it's not just going to be about this little research, this little finding here and this little finding here and this little finding here. Your research is going to begin to have a more significant impact across the business. And so I want to tell you this, leave you with this one last success that we've been able to have here at Rackspace by doing this. Our group originally started four and a half, well, when I got here five years ago. Our group was at the bottom of the operations division. By that time, we did sit next to design. So we did, research had its own identity. I was very uh, privileged to come in uh, to, to that role in a full on research leadership role. Uh, but it was, it was like way down here in the organization. And basically we did usability testing. That was, that was the bulk of what we did. And then uh, because we began to take it larger and answer larger questions and develop these disciplined approaches to doing this and have a goal driven to th start thinking about the business at the goal driven level. What overall are we trying to, to achieve? How do we hook into that? It changed and we got moved up in the organization, moved up again, and now we are moved over and I report directly to the chief marketing officer of all of Rackspace. And my team works all the way across Rackspace to serve any stakeholders needs about any research questions they have. Y'all, that's one of my, my most proud moments and my most proud things. And we did it by applying. I will, I will credit it to a significant uh, part of the effort. One being willing to answer anybody's questions and to help wherever we could, but also being able to ask these business-driven questions in intake, and these business-driven uh, uh, and go business-driven goals in our research. So that's my uh, that's my little presentation. When you get this, you'll get the bonus uh, this bonus slide about uh, research reports, and I have other reports about that. 
And, uh, and then I want to leave you with this final one is when you do get to your reports, this is how you report it. The data tells us it is important at the very end when we present our findings that we step back and we don't say you have to do it this way, you have to do it that way. We get, we, this is where we go back to our stakeholder and we honor them again because they're the first ones who asked they wanted to, and they're the ones who are on the hook for delivering whatever it is that needs to be delivered. And so when they're not willing to believe us, this, these are the words we use. We do not tell them they're wrong. We tell them the data tells us this. We understand you don't want to do that. We understand you can't do that. We understand your constraints, but the data tells us this. And here is the benefit of what finally happens with this. If they do not take after all this work, take our findings and do something with them. We hold those in our archive and we wait until somebody comes back because they will come back. The bad things will happen. And, we, and then we can say, no problem. We already found that for you. Here are the things you need to fix and here are the things you need to solve. Okay, so spoken simply, repeatedly and with clarity, well begun is half done and the data tells us front end, back end, that's the basis of my framework. That is amazing. Thank you so much. Um, we are going to open it up for questions to Laura and I will invite you uh, to come up on stage. I have written a ton of questions myself, um, but uh, if you don't want to come up on stage and ask a question, feel free to uh, ask it in the chat. Let's see. Make Chris the co-host so he can help me promote people. So if you get this notification that we want you to be a panelist and you don't want to come on, no worries. No worries. Sometimes you're somewhere where you can't. Sometimes you just don't want to. Um, but let me start with one of my questions. <laughs> uh, and, and these are in the order that you gave your presentation. This was so fantastic. Um, when you're asking them for what problem you want them to solve, or you, they want you to solve, do you find that they typically know the answer or over time they've learned that you're gonna ask that? Because in my world, it, it, it's often kind of a, an interesting, <laughs> an interesting problem. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, so very, very good question. So uh, we do, st I do still ask the question. So e even if they've heard it over and over, and like I said, my, that, 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 that one product manager who, who would come to me and ask for, you know, what's, can we have that conversation that makes product managers cry? <laughs> <laughs> like he knew what I was going to ask and he did get better at that over time but he also excuse me he knew that I was going to ask it and uh, it's good discipline for me and and for anybody else who's asking from a business person to to whoever else is asking and uh, so so over time yes I do continue to ask that same question do some do they get better at it yeah sometimes we can do this intake in 10 minutes because they're they're more prepared for that but because the the questions in that intake conversation are a framework, I mean, not a framework, but they're a guide, uh, and we might take them in different directions because we're experienced question askers, uh, is that each conversation may end up being different. So I, you know, again, I use those questions as, 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 as my guide. I want to make sure that I answer those questions for myself, but I may take those in different directions each time. So yes, I do have the 20 minute conversation every time. And there's, there's actually a related question in the Q&A here from Ken Copeland, is that in a consultancy when the stakeholders are external uh, and there's other political hurdles, is there anything that I, that I would do different? No, this works even better with external stakeholders because uh, it lets them know that you care about their business. It's like there, so it gives it gives them a level of holding and a level of investment in what you're getting ready to do that that is magical. So no, I think this is even more magical with uh, with with an external consultancy. I would be interested to hear, and, and I've used it myself. So we at Rackspace, we also do serve um, 
customers in that way. So we, we that, that's a service that we offer as well. So no, I ask the same questions of external stakeholders. That's cool that you offer uh, research as a service. Oh, well, what customers. we offer is we offer, um, a, we, we have something called elastic engineering that is a whole package of engineering design and, uh, and then built into that are, are some research questions. Um, the, for the folks that we've brought on board, I'm going to change this to gallery view real quick. Do you guys have questions? Just go ahead and unmute and ask. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Professor. This is Timothy Kelly. <laughs> um, thank you so much. I do have a quick question for, for, for uh, Professor here. Um, Ms. Laura, um, so in regards to the research aspect, I know that you and I have talked in the past and uh, always been great conversations. Uh, my question here is regards to, and when you're talking to the stakeholders, if for instance, you come across a stakeholder where they tell you directly what they want, but then at the sudden moment they, they switch on you, how do you react to their sudden switch? <laughs> so that's a great question. <laughs> um, and, and in truth, that's part of what uh, this framework was designed to overcome um, is that because I ask so much up front and I do planning up front and, and my team, uh, you know, does this in their own time, asking these questions up front. We have that happen less often. And, and so that that's really part of why I do this and recommend it. Uh, so, so that's, that's one thing. And does it still happen sometimes? Yes. So here, here's the first thing that we do is that we apply the be curious formula is that when that happens, that's the first thing we ask them. Wow. What happened? What did somebody say to you? What did somebody tell you? We treat that stakeholder as a human being under pressure. So that that is the thing. It's like so often we before that, honestly, I will tell you, it's like I took that personally. And 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 my folks on my team, as we sat around my kitchen table over the hot soup and bread trying to figure out because we were in pain, <laughs> we took it personally. And so when we began to have compassion for our stakeholder as our internal user, it made a huge, huge difference in our practice. And so the combination of compassion, curiosity, and, and framework has, has just really elevated how we do that. And that again, that happens a lot less often. And when it does happen, we go back and we ask that same question again. It's like, okay, what was the constraint? What was the problem? What obstacle did you hit? What problem are you trying to solve now? What changed? Great question, Timothy. Thank you. It is. Thank you. Yeah. It's, okay. it's a great, when, when you have your objective documented and agreed to, then you can have the scope conversation as a consultant. I need to, it, it's like, if we're changing what we're looking at, that's a scope change and we can certainly accommodate that, you know, but it has implications. Yes, yes. And thank you for bringing up that, that consultant piece because the, this kind of planning can also help you uh, identify how to charge for things and, and split out the various levels of what you do. So like when we get a timeline thing, if there is a like an immediate short-term timeline, for example, or if there's a budgetary constraint that's going to affect that, then then what we'll do is say, okay, well we can give you we can do a really fast heuristic evaluation for you instead, or or this is one of my favorites. We can do this. We understand that we can't meet your timeline to do a full usability study. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this study in parallel. You just keep going along and do your design and do your engineering. And we're just going to do this in parallel as a risk mitigation strategy. And we're going to feed you the results of this along the way. And you'd be amazed at how often they'll actually begin to pick up and use UX research uh, findings if you're willing to do it uh, in parallel along the way. So I don't ever hold up a project for research. That's how I manage that. Yes. Um, somebody else asked a question, uh, when or how would you decide that a research project is done? Does a project ever stop? Uh, no, it doesn't, but we do require uh, ourselves, we have a discipline for ourselves of, of uh, we, we have a disciplined um, uh, sprint process in which we require deliverable of ourselves at a certain point. So it, it really is okay to call it done at some point. And sometimes it's as early as here's the early findings, y'all go run with it. Now we may still do a, an archival full-on report because that can be useful for other things later and most often we will, uh, but, but yeah, is it done? So what I call done is, is can the stakeholders move forward with confident action? That's when it's done. 
Can they move forward with confident action? Because my whole mission as a UX researcher is to spark fast, confident decisions. That's a great way of uh, just staying focused. The whole This whole framework is a wonderful focus piece. I wanna honor anybody who needs to leave at one, no harm, no foul. We're still recording. And, and Laura, do you have a few more minutes to answer a couple more questions? I do, I would love to, I live for this. <laughs> okay, we will, uh, I just wanna respect everyone's time. So if you miss the last little bit, you're not gonna miss anything. We're gonna keep recording. Who else has a question? Caden, I, I see your hand. Oh. Hi, um, so we have a kind of a research project that we're trying to pursue. So this pre presentation was awesome because it actually helped us find a bunch of those preliminary questions to ask before we go into it. But I know that one of those big preliminary questions is to kind of know your audience. How would you approach your research project if the goal of that research project is to understand your audience? So if, are, you, are you asking like, so, are, is to understand the audience, the user audience? So basically we have a membership of a little under 2000 members, but it's so diverse and it comes from so many different sources that we're really trying to understand like what they want and where they're at with their relationship with us. So I guess when we're, we kind of have an audience of our current membership, but the research is really trying to understand what they would, what they want from us, I guess you'd say. So what, why is it you need to know that? Well, because we're credit union. And um, we have one side of our membership that is long-term kind of account holders who have mainly savings accounts, checking accounts. And we have another side who are younger members who really only come and leave for like mortgage loans. And the main thing is that we're, since we're a credit union, we really wanna be serving realtors specifically. So we're trying to find the pattern and all that mix where how can we push this membership that we have more toward serving these realtors so I guess when you have a membership that doesn't completely reflect like uh, what you're trying to serve, how do you shortcut you a little bit here? Mm -hmm. so normally I would listen to the whole thing and take it in, but I'm going to shortcut you a little bit here. Okay. Now, like we're in our, we're going to do this really fast. Okay. So you have this bifurcated, uh, so you have this set of users, but you're trying to shift to, to this other set. And so you need to understand what this, these new ones are and how did you, how you can make that shift so you can focus on your primary. Is that correct? Yes. And expand your primary audience. Okay. So, and if you expand your primary audience, uh, what will that get you as business? Mm -hmm. what, what will that do for you oh. as business? If, you, if you're able to understand those users and expand your primary audience, what will that do for your business? I think it mostly just boosts our general membership. Okay. And uh, it kind of just adds growth and it brings in more income. Um, I mean, it's, we can, we can serve both sides at the end of the day and that we want to be able to serve them all. But, um, I think what our niche is, is like, we have a niche, but our membership doesn't reflect that niche. Got it. So that's kind of, okay. So we're trying to push to that direction. So here I have just done a user research intake with you. Your business goal is to boost your general mem membership to achieve growth and to increase revenue. You want to do this by expanding your primary audience to serve realtors. And the problem that you're encountering is that you have, uh, you have this bifurcated user set where you have you know, a user this way, and but you're really trying to get and build this other. This is part one of our user research intake. And, and then what method does this suggest? Uh, can you expand on that question a little bit? What no, that's do you mean okay. Go ahead and give me the answer in the interest of time. Okay. So in this, it's like if what we're trying to do is understand more about this audience, because we are trying to boost that audience, then a method, some of the methods that we might want to understand is that might, we may want to do ethnographic research um, or, or this exploratory research with realtors so that we can understand their uh, their user their goals in their own business, uh, and uh, is it, so so that we can serve them and the and attract them in the best possible way. 
That's awesome. That's a, that's a really good answer. There you go. That with that, and that's the practice. That's how it works. Mm -hmm. I, love I love that you're demonstrating the, the tool real time right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because I just presented the tool, y'all. This is how I've now trained my brain to work. It's actually, it's actually how to do it. Well, that thank you very much. You're welcome. My Thanks, pleasure. Thanks, Kate. That was really helpful. I'm so happy we captured that. Who else has a question? Uh, just a comment. I, I second that. That was a, a fantastic question answer showing off what you were just talking about, really. I mean, good stuff. Keep going. Thank you. Uh, so there was one more question I saw up. Uh, have you ever experienced a stakeholder shift during a project where new stakeholders enter into the timeline midway and voice alternate goals? Of course. It's like, I, I, I could say, like, everybody raise your hands who've experienced this one. Yes, of course you do. And so this is this is where you do a two-part, a, a kind of a two-part approach. One is you, you figure out where you can pivot. I will tell you the single most uh, valuable thing that my team has been willing to do is to let go of our own rigidity. So uh, like I said, I use these frameworks, but I use these frameworks in a loose fashion. It's like it, I, I use them to guide and to help and to, to problem solve. But once I'm, if I'm going a particular direction in, in a goal, I mean, a whole business can change direction before, you know, from the beginning of where we did an intake to when we're getting ready to do a study. So this is one of the beauties of, of our various research methods is that if we still, all we have to do is, is just first find out, is it because a goal has changed? Are we now about, instead of like, like just now answering that question, they're about increasing revenue. What if the sudden goal is because of quarterly results, we need to reduce costs. And so we're gonna change slightly how we do that by making these things simpler or automating this thing, then we're willing to pivot on that. And one of the, this is also a really good argument for qualitative research as often as possible because qualitative research is the single most flexible method because not only can you can you change it like just right before your session or something, you can change it during a session. Mm -hmm. And so if you have new stakeholders coming in, you can you can shift on a dime with a qualitative session and you'll become better and better at this. And if you've done a disciplined research plan, even if you have to change it at the last minute, you'll already have a framework for how to do it. And you just have to change some of the directions you take it. And so uh, so absolutely very good question. So the biggest answer to that one, the biggest formula to that, be willing to shift. So be curious, be curious about why it's shifting to make sure that you really want to shift it. Cause sometimes externals will come in and they really have the same goals, but they just are thinking about them in different words. Uh, but so be curious first and then be willing to be flexible. It's like, I, I will tell you all that's, I, I and my team, we, we work really hard at being, sometimes being at somebody else's mercy but in terms of changing direction and things, but that is because we are here to serve the whole business and all of the business goals. And a lot of other people have jobs that they're trying to keep and succeed in, and we're trying to help them do that. So when we keep that at the heart of our practice, it makes all the difference in, in how we're able and willing to go with and to serve what needs to be done now. Who else has a question? I actually have one more question uh, for, for Ms. Laura. This is Timothy Kelly again. Um, so another question I uh, recently just came across a situation that um, sometimes I've noticed that while I'm talking with the stakeholders, sometimes um, their interests kind of like levers off to, to another direction. I mean, like they kind of like lose focus once you start having conversations and it's going. And then what they talk about in the beginning it doesn't end with that. How do you keep them focused and on track, so to speak? I'm talking from a new uh, UX researcher perspective here. Thank so, you. Uh, so I'm not sure if that if that's what happened. If that if what you're saying is happening during like the course of the of of a whole project, or if that happens like during the report. I will say that that kind of attention wandering does happen often during a report if we don't do it in the right mm -hmm. order. 
because we want when we always want to start with and this is where you have the the little bonus section and and some other uh, articles that that you can read that I've written, which is that uh, is that we focus on on the top three recommendations right up front and we tell them what and the top three findings if we share nothing else with them we do that we do not start by telling them about the methods and we don't start with telling them about step by step findings so it's usually in the in the reporting phase that that attention wandering happens because this is what they want to know they want to know what do i need to do and why do i need to do it and uh so that's one of those uh, that I that I share. Susan and Susan is sharing the link to my uh, to my medium uh, uh, feed to my all my articles there. So that's 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 one way. If it changes again, same way I answered Angie. If it changes during the course of a program, you want to be curious. You want to ask why, and then you want to point them back to the goals. Did the, the did the business goals change? Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Let's do one more question. And then let Laura get back to her life. Any anybody have one? Uh, I have a question. Um, thank you for this amazing presentation. Sometimes uh, stakeholders come with a specific research method in mind. Okay, can you do tree testing or can you do usability study? How do you um, kind of deal with them and uh, tell them in a in a focus group that's my favorite oh yes oh my god that's the worst okay uh so that is that is an excellent question it is also why i do a discipline research plan that has the goals and because once we once i have the objectives down it's like as a professional researcher I know what kind of method is going to get me to answering this question. So just like we did a minute ago when I did the, the live intake and we got down to what we probably need is ethnographic research, we might need task analysis, that sort of thing. Uh, uh, same thing, same thing here is that is is that I will tell them, OK, so that method is not really going to get you the answers to your questions. So that's what you tell them. It's like like that method is not going to help you answer your questions. We really need to do it this way. Mm -hmm. And uh, and actually, a focus group is not really going to help you because they're going to influence each other, and you're not going to get clean answers to your questions. So just let's just try this out. And if this doesn't work, mm -hmm. then we'll add on some other sessions like the ones you want. <laughs> okay. So I, uh, refer back to their goals and reiterate uh, what the goals <laughs> and objectives. Absolutely, every time. Yeah, it's kind of an insurance policy that research plan is. There are some really good uh, images available online that have all the different research methods. And if you present it as there's a whole panoply of tools. And when I'm trying to sell one of these, I, I always sell to business people with speed or cost. <laughs> um, in addition to quality, which is Laura's, Laura's uh, position is let's sell to quality, which I'm all in favor. But as a consultant, and I'm trying to get my way, <laughs> if you will, um, appealing to speed or uh, budget are very effective secondary motivators. And that so uh, and and trailing onto that, I actually do that a lot as well. Is that because uh, because I'll in, necessarily instead of cost, I'll use timeline uh, as that. Is that uh, it's very much faster to do a qualitative study and we get in-depth data points mm -hmm. as opposed to a survey, which is difficult and gives you a lot of a lot of shallow data points, and uh, and that the qualitative study is going to tell you why as well as the what, and so that's like that's an example of how I'll shift them from one method to another um, that and and it often has to do with timeline and cost. Uh, and and where is that picture that you referred to? Uh... I can include it on the on the page where we post the recording. Okay. The picture of all the UX research methods. Here's how I would find it though, and this is what I'm going to do. Go to images.google.com, type in UX research methods. Okay. <laughs> and there'll be a whole bunch of them. I'll I'll pick my favorite, you pick yours. Thank you. And, um, and because you're here, um, I am willing to connect on LinkedIn. Do find me. I just love to have conversations with, with people in our field. So uh, so feel free to find me. I should be fairly easy to find. And uh, yeah, I really appreciate getting to be here today. Laura, um, this has been an amazing session. 
Uh, thank you so much for agreeing to share your wisdom with everybody. And um, I don't have a topic yet for December, but we will be doing a session, uh, Firecat First Friday in December. And again, if you have uh, suggestions for a topic for next month or uh, um, in the future, please let me know which topics interest you. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor. Have a good one.